stage and deliver his welcome remarks. Mr. So, please. Lord Green, Consul General Andrew Seaton, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to this lunch to welcome Lord Green. And to Lord Green, I'll say, Stephen, welcome home. <laughs> In spite of your elevated status, to us, you're always our dear friend, Stephen, Hong Kong citizen and chairman of Hong Kong Bank. I hasten to add that we are very lucky to have you in London looking after our interest. Uh, an example is uh, last year in September, we organized a promotion in London entitled Think Asia, Think Hong Kong. And Stephen's uh, department gave us tremendous support. We brought forth as many as 2,000 uh, UK companies to the various activities, promoting Hong Kong as the most effective gateway to penetrate the market in Asia especially China. And since then, thousands of inquiries have come into our London office uh, looking for business opportunities in this part of the world. UK also features prominently in the uh, Asian Financial Forum back in January uh, with uh, George Osman, Chancellor of Exchequer, and Douglas Fint, the current chairman of HSBC, uh, are taking part. Other than this, there are numerous other examples of UK's robust involvement in our trade and business promotion activities. Uh, one example is that there's a strong delegation of UK filmmakers and buyers to our film mart in March. And the film market in Hong Kong has become one of the three largest film markets in the world alongside Hollywood and Cannes. Of course, uh, Stephen is paid by the UK government and he does not work for Hong Kong alone. He's also working hard to promote UK exports and inward investment into the UK. And in that area, he has achieved great success. You only have to look at the number of Rolls Royce cars and Bentleys and Jaguars on our roads. And uh, all the British shops, uh, uh, Burberry's and Daniel and, uh, are doing this business. Not to mention the number of Rolls Royce engines fitted onto our airplanes. And of course, even more importantly, the, impo the, the investment pouring into the UK. A uh, recent case is uh, the investment by uh, uh, Winky and uh, Sherry Chan here uh, to acquire Aquascutum. And of course, uh, Cheung Kong investment, Cheung Kong infrastructure has made tremendous investments also in the UK infrastructure. So in a word, uh, Stephen actually personifies the bond between Hong Kong and the UK which I must say has become stronger since the handover. I'm sure uh, Andrew, you will bear, bear witness to that. So to, to conclude on your behalf, I'd like to once again thank Stephen for all that he's doing for Hong Kong and wish him all the best in his future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. So. May I now invite Lord Green, Minister of, Trade for, Minister of State for Trade and Investment of the United Kingdom to deliver his speech. Lord Green, please. Jack, uh, thank you very much for those uh, far too kind words of introduction. But it is, of course, always a great personal pleasure for me to be back here in Hong Kong. And as you say, it feels like coming home. Uh, coming home with a different hat on, um, although it is actually my third visit to Hong Kong since I took this job up. I hope that fact alone uh, underscores for you the importance that the British government attaches to the trade and investment relationship with Hong Kong. Uh, and of course, I have come this morning from Shenzhen, get it right, uh, and from Beijing the day before that. And so uh, the, the, the theme of China as uh, a uh, major destination for trade and a major investment flow for us is one that you will uh, not be at all surprised to hear me dwelling on over the next few minutes. What I thought I would do over the next few minutes is to talk a little bit about the British economic challenge, where we've come from, what we're trying to do, uh, and some of the challenges we obviously face, but some of the reasons why I think the glass is absolutely half full and not half empty, um, and why I think the reason why it's half full depends a lot on what's going on here in Hong Kong 
and more broadly in China. As we come out of the financial and economic crisis that uh, unleashed itself on the world in 2007, 2008, if there's one thing that the British all learnt, uh, it's that the growth model that was driving economic performance in Britain in the run-up to the crisis um, is bankrupt. Uh, we learnt that an economy that was growing as it was on the basis of uh, consumption fueled by debt, and then in the last few years, government spending, which is of course also fueled by debt, uh, can't go on that way. Uh, and we had to find a new growth model. And the economics textbooks, I hesitate to talk about economics in the presence of Larry, for example, uh, uh, who, who knows much more about this than I will ever know, but the textbooks tell you that if you're not going to grow on the basis of consumption and government spending, there are only two other ways of driving demand. One is investment and one is trade. In other words, the trade and investment brief that, uh, that I have as part of the British government is in fact uh, one that is pretty central to any meaningful, sustainable growth strategy for the country going forwards. We have, in short, to rebalance our economy, the British, away from too much reliance on domestic consumption demand towards a much more effective and competitive engagement with the international markets uh, and a stronger investment performance. That way lies sustainable growth and job creation. And we have a good story to tell in some respects. Uh, so far as investment is concerned, I'll talk in shortly about trade. I want to focus first on investment. Uh, one of the great uh, and insufficiently sung secrets of the Britain, British economy is that it really is open for business. There is no developed economy in the world which is as open for access by foreign direct investment as the British economy. This is not a policy point. It's actually in the genes. It's in the culture of the, of the country. It's certainly not a partisan point. It's been in place for decades, this openness to, Brit uh, to, to, to foreign investment in the British economy. Uh, all sorts of examples. Uh, Larry's just, uh, sorry, Jack has just uh, run off a number of the key exciting examples of investment, particularly in uh, upmarket retail activity. Um, but uh, let me talk just a little bit about the car industry in Britain. Uh, those of us who can remember the 1970s and 80s uh, will know uh, that the British car industry was, was being run into the ground at that point in time, uh, and that it was essentially rescued initially by Japanese investment, uh, uh, and then subsequently by German investment, uh, enhanced American investment, uh, and uh, most strikingly, most recently, Indian investment in the form of Tata's purchase of Jaguar Land Rover. And we've got to a position where basically all of the volume production in, in the British car industry is uh, 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 driven by foreign-owned entities. And 80% of that uh, output is now exported. And indeed, just this last month, we arrived at a point when, for the first time since about 1976, Britain exported more cars than it imported. And the graph is very sharply upwards. Jaguar Land Rover basically can't make the Jaguars fast enough for the growth in Chinese demand, for example. Uh, and having been on the streets of Beijing the day before last, uh, the numbers of Bentleys and Rolls Royces as well as Jaguars uh, are testimony to the way in which the British car industry is basically uh, back from the dead on the basis of foreign direct investment. It's an extraordinary performance and it's come from being open to uh, uh, investment from all comers. There isn't a single other developed country that can tell the same story. And in the European context, Britain remains in pole position as far as uh, uh, receipt of foreign direct investment is concerned. And a larger proportion of economic output in Britain is supported by foreign direct investment by miles, actually, than in any other European country. It's a position we intend to maintain. It's a position we intend to maintain, firstly, by ensuring that we have uh, as reasonably business-friendly a tax regime as we can, and I think we have a good story to tell on that front. It's a, it's a position we intend to maintain by ensuring that the regulatory environment is as transparent and open and fair as we can and predictable. Um, we don't always get things right on that front, but again, I think relative to key competitors, which is the way we should think about this, I think we have a reasonably good story to tell. It's a uh, position we intend to maintain also 
I use the word culturally, I don't know what the right word is, but the attitude of the British to this is something that is very important. It's there, uh, it's, it's an unquestioning attitude. There's very little public questioning about the role of foreign direct investment. When CIC bought 9% of Thames Water in January, there was barely a comment in any of the British media outside of the Financial Times. That's a result. Can you imagine that 10% of the New York water supply being bought by a Chinese sovereign wealth fund and it going by with little or no public comment? It's a serious competitive advantage that we intend to build on uh, because I think investment uh, is uh, something that is crucial to driving our growth. We need to invest particularly in the public economic infrastructure of Britain. Britain's kindest friends wouldn't accuse it of having a world-class public economic infrastructure. Uh, and anybody who drives around Hong Kong for 25 minutes will uh, be immediately reminded of the difference between a really high quality public economic infrastructure and the one that the British have. And so we know uh, that we have got to make major investments over the next five or ten years in the economic infrastructure. And we're on the case. The last government started, and this government has continued, the development of what we now call a national infrastructure plan, which is an increasingly specific list of the projects that we have to get done in energy supply, in transport, in broadband, in water, and in waste. Not to mention hospitals and schools and so forth. But just focusing on those economic infrastructure investments, we are looking at the mobilization of something like 200 billion pounds worth of capital investment over the next five years, and probably continuing at about that rate for at least the five years after that which represents an increase in investment of something of the order of 40 or 50% over the run rate looking backwards over the last 10 years. This is quite a challenge, and one thing is clear, uh, given the state of the government coffers, this is not uh, all or even mostly going to come directly from the Exchequer. Our task is to mobilise foreign direct investment into these areas of economic activity. Uh, and a lot of my time is spent uh, uh, talking with sovereign wealth funds, in both, up, uh, both up north from here, of course, in the Middle East, Singapore and elsewhere. The uh, Canadian pension funds who've been very imaginative about investing in British economic infrastructure. Uh, and, of course, in working with domestic sources of long-term capital to mobilise a greater degree of interest from them. This is a significant task, but we're on the case, and I am optimistic uh, that we will see reasonable progress over the next few years in upgrading the British economic infrastructure and thereby, of course, contributing to the level of demand in the British economy. The other big theme uh, is trade, of course. Uh, exports uh, are a source of job creation and a source of growth. And our challenge is to do a better job than the British have done looking backwards of our net trade performance. We, the British, have had a weak trade position for about the last 50 years. All of the working careers of uh, every, all of my colleagues uh, have been uh, uh, worked out at a time when Britain has lurched from one weak trade position to another one. And in fact, if you look, about, uh, look at the numbers, although it's a little bit volatile from one year to the next, roughly speaking, decade by decade, it's deteriorated, and the noughties were the worst decade of the lot. We know we can't go on like that. We know that we have to turn trade into a driver of growth instead of a drag on growth, which is what it has been for much of the last half century. And our challenge can be put in two forms. First of all, we've got to engage more British companies in the international markets. We are, in fact, behind the European curve in the terms of the proportion of British companies that trade overseas compared with the European average. So one of the challenges we've set ourselves is to get up to the European average over the next few years, which would involve something like another 100,000 British companies of all shapes and sizes, including very small ones, getting into the international markets. That's quite a significant challenge, of course, but it's not an undoable one. As I like to tell uh, members of Parliament in Britain, if you take the number of parliamentary constituencies there are in Britain, and divide that into this 100,000 and spread it over four or five years, which is the, the, the time frame we've set ourselves, it works out at about another 35 companies per constituency per year getting into the international markets. And put like that, that sounds to me like a target we can, we can achieve. I also know 
from my travels around Britain over the last 18 months that I've been doing this job, that in every sector of economic activity, you will find companies who are large, small, high-tech, traditional, old, new, who are already dynamic, inventive, and in the international markets. The, uh, Britain is a country that exports sushi to Japan. It's a country that exports tea to China. It's a country that exports cheese to France. It's a country, of course, that exports Scottish whiskey all over the place, <laughs> as well as being the country that makes the wings of the Airbuses and many of the engines that go on the Airbuses and the Jaguars that I've already mentioned and the creative industries, uh, the music industry. Britain is the second largest exporter of music in the world. I'm sometimes tempted to say to my granddaughter that I'm not sure it's all really music, but at any rate, it earns dollars and that's what counts. I could go on. The real point is that Britain is a broad-based economy. It does need to engage more successfully in the international markets, and our challenge is to make that happen. And we do this, of course, against a at a time when the headwinds are against us. We are trying to carry through a quite substantial rebalancing of the British economy at a time when our largest single export market, the Eurozone, is in the state that it's in. And so it's not merely a matter of encouraging more British companies into the export markets. We have also to encourage them to look further afield than just across the channel for the reasons that you will all appreciate. And so I find myself saying to British companies up and down uh, the country, uh, look overseas, that's where the growth's going to come from. Uh, and as an aside, by the way, there's m plenty of evidence that a company that gets into the international markets becomes competitively more efficient, and the gains are not just uh, trivial, they're substantial and quick. On average, something like a 30% productivity growth in the first year of exporting. And therefore, getting more companies into the international markets is about strengthening the backbone of the whole economy. And I find myself saying to these companies, don't just cross the channel. Or if you're already across the channel, look further afield because the growth's going to come uh, from further afield. And so look in particular, obviously, at Asia. And within Asia, obviously, in particular, at China. There is no country of greater strategic importance to us economically uh, than China is for all of the reasons that you don't need me to tell you. And so encouraging more and more British businesses to look at the Chinese opportunity is a key part of what I spend my time doing. The good news is that I think we're getting traction. I think that the evidence is from UK Trade and Investment uh, and their offices around the mainland that we're, get, we're seeing more and more British companies come through to take a look at the opportunities. Uh, we're leading trade missions and so forth and again uh, across a wide range of sectors of activity. There's a long way to go on this, of course. I find myself repeatedly saying to ministerial colleagues and the media and anyone else who will listen that this is a marathon and not a sprint. If we've lived with a weak trade position for the last 50 years, it isn't going to turn around in one year or two years. We have to stick at it, not just for the lifetime of one parliament, i.e. not till just till 2015. This has to be the big economic preoccupation of the British for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But I say that knowing that the fundamental strengths to do this are there. And in the context of China, of course, then the role of Hong Kong is crucial to us. For all sorts of historical reasons, the bonds are very strong and deep and long-standing. There are 300 British companies that have their regional headquarters here, as far as uh, I know, and the, that, that may be an undercount. Uh, the British Chamber here has a, has a, has a thousand members. Um, neither of those two numbers represents the full uh, array of British presences in Hong Kong. And again, you don't need me to tell you, but I find myself often having to remind people back at the ranch that Hong Kong is just the great gateway to China. Uh, the, the Think Asia, Think Hong Kong uh, strapline says it all. Uh, and the results of that event that we held in September, or Jack in, uh, and the TDC held in September, speak for themselves in terms of the resonance with the British, uh, uh, the notion that Hong Kong is a, a familiar place, uh, a familiar stepping stone uh, for the mainland. Through SEPA, I just met this morning a company uh, at the breakfast I was having in Shenzhen uh, who have used SEPA as a, me a British company, that have used SEPA as a means of getting into the mainland market. Now, that was one single company around one breakfast table. I am sure that that will be replicated many times over. 
And the general point is this. Uh, we're on the case. Uh, we're rebalancing the economy. We're doing this at difficult times. You will be aware that the overall growth performance of the British economy is, to say the least, at the moment, flat. Uh, actually, slightly negative in the last quarter and the one before that, effectively flat. Um, it's not surprising, given the circumstances of the immediate hinterland. Within that, however, the signs of rebalancing are there. Manufacturing is growing faster than GMP, and exports are growing a lot faster than GMP. Ex British exports to Hong Kong uh, were up 17% uh, last year. China exports to China were up 21% last year. Uh, and I could go on quoting statistics for India and Russia and so forth. We're on the case. The rebalancing is taking place. It will take time. Uh, we are going to stick at it. And we are also going to stick at the fiscal consolidation program that the government launched more or less the day it took office, uh, and which uh, I passionately believe is the right thing for us to be doing and has got us into the position where not only have we kept our AAA rating, but also... Uh, the yield on British government bonds is the lowest that it has been since the Bank of England started keeping statistics in 1703. Uh, this is a real testimony of a market vote of confidence in what is uh, a debt consolidation program that is not painless, but which has been consistently seen through and which will provide the foundations for a very strong rebalancing uh, of an economy which has a sustainable growth prospect and a job creation prospect for the next generation uh, which uh, I think we should all care about. So uh, I end on the note of the importance of that link between Britain and the mainland and Hong Kong, both in its own right as a market where a lot of British companies have had a lot of experience uh, and, and continue to uh, want to invest, uh, and also, of course, as springboard into the mainland. Thank you very much for inviting me. Like I said, it's always a great pleasure to be back home. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Green, for your insightful remarks. Would you please remain on stage? Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Green has kindly agreed to answer a few questions from the floor. Now, we would like to invite Mr. Andrew Weir, Vice Chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, to moderate this Q&A session for us. Mr. Weir, would you please come on stage? Our staff will come by and collect your question paper now. You are also welcome to raise your hands. We will come to you with microphones. Mr. Weir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Lord Green. And, uh, on behalf of British Chamber of Commerce, it really is a pleasure to welcome you and also to facilitate the questions. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a fundamental shift in the level of engagement of the British government uh, with the community in Hong Kong and also in China, and we really thank you for it. Thank you. I'm sure you're a major part of that, Stephen. Uh, secondly, we, we admire greatly your energy. Shenzhen this morning, Hong Kong for lunch and the night flight back to Heathrow this evening. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned an old strap line of the tourism board. There's another old strap line of the tourism board. And I see a few ex-chairmen here today, which is stay another day. So uh, next, next time, time Stephen, <laughs> please do. And uh, you can help stimulate our economy as well. Uh, so it's a free form session for the questions. Uh, very pleased to take uh, any questions, but I think it's only fair, as the TDC has helped to arrange so much, if the first question goes to our friends from the TDC. And I think Joe Kintz, the head of communications of TDC, is in order. Oh, Joe, yes. Please. Actually, not the head, but uh, we're working in that section. Actually, Lord Green, uh, in September at Think Asia, Think Hong Kong, you recast that old phrase, go west, young man, as, you know, go east, young person. What sense do you get since that event and in general that UK companies are taking up that challenge and that advice? Well, I think they are. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I see this in the volume of business coming through UK trade and investments, most obviously. Uh, of, uh, we're expanding the network uh, in a number of Asian centers, India for one, mainland China for another, uh, and some others as well, Indonesia. Um, and, and we're doing so in response to demand. So I think it is clear that more and more British companies are looking at the opportunities eastwards. Um, and long may that continue, because we've got a long way to go on this journey. Thank you, Joe. If I could look for the next question, please. We have some roving microphones. Oh, Christopher. Uh, Lord Green, uh, much of your talk has been uh, put the emphasis on to manufacture and the growth of uh, the manufacturing side and trade side of the United Kingdom. One of the areas you've been fairly quiet about, it seems to me, has been the whole issue of 
uh, the financial services, which hitherto have always been one of the great strengths. Are we going back to the invisibles, or are we actually uh, seeing uh, the impact of the global issues in the, in the regulated markets that are affecting the financial service industry? And is there a certain degree of uncertainty about where things are going in the future? Well, um, we're not going back to the old day of invisibles, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, for those of you who don't recognize the illusion there, Britain used to talk about its services exports as its invisibles exports, which is a, r a ridiculous uh, piece of terminology. Um, no, uh, and, and, and just so that everybody understands it, you, now, despite all of the uh, upheavals that have gone on in the financial services sector, it is still the case that by far the largest single net exporting sector in the British economy is the financial services sector. Anybody who forgets that, uh, in, in my position, will be uh, 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 neglecting their responsibilities. And very clearly, uh, financial services remain an important export uh, opportunity for the British. I think that London's role as leading international financial centre uh, is one which is uh, extremely important to any strategic understanding of the British economy. And I would add that for all of the near-term difficulties that have to do with the state of the Eurozone and so forth, and the lessons learned from the financial crisis, the role of uh, London and the international financial markets in supporting economic development over the next generation is going to be as critical as it ever was. Um, just one way of looking at this is that if I'm right that the big challenge in the global capital markets over the next generation is going to be mobilizing enough capital for the huge infrastructure programs being rolled out in country after country after country, then the role of London is, in my view, uh, to say secure be sounding complacent, but, but very clearly uh, uh, critical. I, let's, if I may, I'd like to elaborate on that just for a moment. I've talked about British infrastructure needs, but in fact, every emerging country in the world has got major inf infrastructure investment ambitions. The Americans uh, have major infrastructure needs. There are 6,000 bridges, I've heard it estimated, that need to be rebuilt in America over the next few years. So wherever you looked, whether it's the developed countries or developing countries, um, infrastructure is going to be a big theme over the next generation. Relatively little of that is going to be financed by government checks. The big task is going to be mobilizing quite a lot of what is effectively private sector capital in the form of pri public-private partnerships of one sort or another uh, in order to get this financed. And the role of London as a source of global PPP expertise is one which I think is unquestioned. Therefore, when people ask me, is the role of London as a financial center in somehow in question because of the financial crisis, I answer not at all. Clearly, it's important that the policy framework gets uh, set right. Uh, you don't want me to get into a detailed discussion of regulatory issues, I'm sure. But the basic point that the strategic significance of London to the British economy and indeed to the world capital markets is, uh, is unquestioned for the next generation, that's something I passionately believe in. Actually, Lord Green, if, just a follow-up question, which is actually relevant uh, here, is your perspective on the RMB market in London? and the scope for further exchanges of that in Europe? Uh, well, there are, more pe there are people in this room who know a lot more about the RMB market uh, than I do. <laughs> um, but I, look, I, 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 think that, um, I think this is a natural development from the point of view of the Chinese authorities. Um, the, the role of Hong Kong as, as international RMB center, of course, is already well established. I believe that it makes every logical sense for the Chinese authorities to want to see a major renminbi trading center in the Western Hemisphere. And I certainly, you would expect me to argue, uh, uh, that, uh, believe that London is the right place for it to be. Uh, I think that, the, therefore, the agreement that was uh, uh, announced when George Osborne was last in Beijing uh, is of real strategic significance. Uh, and I think that in times to come, you're going to see London emerge alongside Hong Kong in partnership with Hong Kong as a major uh, uh, center for the, for the renminbi. We've already seen one renminbi bond, of course, issued by my former employer, mm -hmm. Stuart, take a bow. And, uh, uh, and there will be many more to come, of course. Okay. Thank you. Hello, uh, Law Green. My name is Thomas, Thomas Wong. My question is this. Uh, you have been talking about a UK company uh, investing in China using Hong Kong as a gateway. My question is this. Uh, how could Hong Kong companies benefit when the, Chi when the Chinese companies, they want to invest in Europe, but using UK as a gateway? 
uh, how can Hong Kong companies benefit? Uh, I, um, that's an interesting um, addition to the question. I, I do believe uh, that one of the selling propositions of the British economy is that it's a great place to be not only as a market in its own right, but as the best bridgehead into Europe of them all. Um, and indeed, what we're seeing in many cases, including uh, Chinese, mainland Chinese companies, Indian companies and others, is that a very high proportion of those that come to Europe come and set up their European uh, regional headquarters, and sometimes their headquarters for both Europe and Africa and Middle East in London or in the UK, uh, rather than anywhere else in Europe. I think uh, there are obvious reasons why um, there's a competitive advantage. Um, uh, you'd expect me to say, but I believe it to be true. The English language, uh, English common law, the time zone, London as a cluster, and so on. And it does seem to be a magnet, uh, which has resulted in the fact that uh, uh, the UK is in pole position in terms of foreign direct investment into Europe. Now, you asked a, 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 an extra twist on that, as how can Hong Kong companies benefit when, China, when mainland companies invest in the, in the UK? I suppose that probably depends on case by case what, uh, what the specifics are. Oh, excuse me. Yes, we have another question over here. Lord, before I ask my question, let me say that you're always welcome to come back to Hong Kong. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I thought I heard you said that uh, there are plans to have 100,000 British entrepreneurs traveling the world. And it occurs to me that, since you mentioned a little while ago, that you're looking forward to closer partnership with Hong Kong. I would suggest you and Jack so get together to set up a quote of 5,000 of that 100,000 to come to Hong Kong and uh, use Hong Kong as a jumping off point and as a center for Asia. And I think they'll, they'll, that 5,000 will always be welcome and they'll be very profitable for your future plans for the British economy. Well, that's a great idea. I, I really like that. Uh, and Jack, you and I are gonna have a conversation about that after this lunch about how we do it. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I, uh, we, well, 100,000 extra companies into the international markets, that's our challenge. Um, and uh, as I've said before, we have to encourage people to think more broadly, more ambitiously than just crossing the channel. Um, China's uh, a, a hugely strategically important story for reasons you don't need me to explain. The great thing about Hong Kong as a jumping off ground for that, for a small British business is, this is a relatively familiar, relatively known quantity, uh, an open market, and I think it's a great idea. Jack, we'll have a conversation after lunch. Well, going back to the written questions, there's three questions here on, on Europe, uh, and how you see it panning out over the next two years, UK trade into the Eurozone, which I think is about 50% of UK trade. Uh, how do you see the next two years going? Well, uh, as far as British trade is concerned, it's 45% of British total, total exports as of now, and obviously that percentage going down slightly year by year, given the growth in emerging markets. Uh, and and uh, we don't want to give that up, obviously. I, I mean, Europe remains... It's important to remember, for all of the difficulties of, of the Eurozone and the European Union at the moment, this is a market of 500 million people that's pretty wealthy on average. Uh, this is a market where there's great business to be done, it's just that it isn't overall one that's growing. Um, and uh, my message to British businesses, uh, w when they ask that question, should we bother about the Eurozone, is, well, of course, you know, th there is, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of obvious opportunities there. And I could tell you the anecdotes of, uh, of, of remarkably improbable companies starting to export into places like Portugal uh, in recent times, which, which remind me uh, that, that, that it isn't, that it's wrong to assume that there are no opportunities there. Nevertheless, the, 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 the high-level truth is that growth isn't going to be coming from the Eurozone uh, in, in any significant amount for, for, the, for, for a while, uh, whereas the fast growth in the world's economy is in Asia, Middle East, Latin America, increasingly in Africa. That's another theme that I find myself wanting to stress. Seven, seven out of the top ten fastest-growing countries in the world in the last five years, seven of them are African. Uh, 
Lord Green, uh, James Woodrow from Cathay Pacific. Um, what's your view on Heathrow as a, as a bottleneck on, on trade? And, uh, and what, how do you think we can actually move forward as far as sorting out L London airports? I knew there'd be a difficult question sooner or later. <laughs> I, uh, look, uh, I'm, a, I'm a great user of Heathrow. Um, and many people in this room are great users of Heathrow. It, it's still uh, the largest single airport hub in Europe. Um, the passenger experience, what can I say? I think the terminals are getting better. I think, uh, personally, I think Terminal 5 is as good as any terminal anywhere in the world. Uh, the new terminal that's replacing Terminal 2 will be pretty spectacular. But we all know what the real problem is. It has, there's, uh, well, uh, there's, there's one sh uh, that has got the headlines recently, which is clearly a fixable problem, uh, i.e. the length of the queues. Uh, the real problem, of course, is the third runway. Um, you know what the British government, you, you of all people with Cathay will know what the British government's position is on that. Um, and to be honest, um, I'm not sure things are going to change greatly in the foreseeable future. We are going to have a major airport in, uh, to, the, to the west of London with two runways instead of three. Um, there's a consultation just been launched, again, as you, you will be aware, on what we do about airport strategy. If there's one thing that I would say of a rather... I, and I say this because I think it's often overlooked in the discussion, is that it's very important for Britain to think about its airport strategy in connection with its rail strategy um, and how you link up uh, airport capacity with rail connections is uh, critical to the, the, the final decisions that get taken. Thank you, Lord Green. I'm Shirley Chan of uh, YGM. And just now, thank you, uh, Jack, to say thank that. Thank you for buying Aquascutum. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I just want to ask you something. You know, we just acquired, you know, Aquascutum on a going concern basis. That means we keep the jobs, you know, and then we create more, you know, opportunities there. But, you know, I'd like to ask this. Is there any hurdles being a foreign investment into UK? And what would, you know, the British think about, you know, a foreign company to own, you know, a British heritage brand? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I, I think that um, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. I actually think that the British public is very um, open to this. And indeed, there are so many examples now of where major brands are foreign owned and it has no impact whatever on the public uh, valuation of those brands and has, of course, a very positive impact on investment in the brands. Uh, I mean, Jaguar and Land Rover are one obvious example of that, where it's not merely that they are owned by the Tata Group now, but the Tata have ploughed a very large amounts of capital into rejuvenating the product that goes with the brand. Bentley and Rolls-Royce are both foreign-owned. Uh, a number of the retail services brands that we associate with the British image are, in fact, foreign-owned. Uh, so there are, there are lots and lots of examples which I think give assurance to a foreign direct investor uh, that Britain really is a level playing field that's open, open to, to all comers. Um, and I think, it's a, I think it's a great opportunity, and I think it's a real source of competitive advantage for Britain compared with its uh, uh, rivals in the neighbourhood and more generally in the developed world. Thank you, Shirley. Very good timing this lunch, actually. Very good. Uh, Lord Green, I could just ask, uh, take advantage of the microphone. Um, you wrote a very well-received book, uh, about morality and the role of business. And just interested, after two years' experience in government, having a look at many different aspects of life, any new reflections on the role of business <laughs> and, the ch and any changes which need to be made? Well, well, I can tell you one thing I'm not going to do is to write one of those books by ministers that have been in government for two or three years about what life in government was like. <laughs> um, um, and actually, at the m if I were asked to do that book again, no, I don't think I would do it differently. Um, because I think that, well, because I think what I said there is still what I what I think. Um, I, I think broadly, there's a growing sense of, to use the cliche, corporate social responsibility in businesses in every country in the world. Uh, I mean, and, and and it's not just done for tokenism. It's not just done um, because businesses think they need to to be accepted by their shareholders or by their customers. You, you know, you talk to managements in companies of all short, sorts of shapes and sizes, and there's a real sense that they owe this to the communities in which they do their business. They may also argue that it's in their long-term interests to show good 
uh, corporate uh, behavior in the community. But it isn't just that. There's a real sense that this is what gives the owner and the employees real satisfaction in doing their job. So uh, do I think this is continuing of continuing importance? Absolutely. And we do have to recognize that around the world, there's been a very substantial deterioration in the public trust in, in companies. Um, uh, and clearly, that was particularly true in the financial services sector, with which I am most familiar. But it's not just the financial services sector. It's much more broadly true that survey after survey shows a decline in public trust in companies. That's not healthy, and so we have to work to rebuild that trust. And I think that's done by an appropriately long-term focus on the sustainable development of the business. And if you have a long-term focus on the sustainable development of the business, you necessarily uh, want a responsible approach to the communities within which you do the business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very clear. Uh, any further questions from the floor? In that case, uh, it's my privilege to give the last question to our friends at the press, and I think Joyce is waving at me. Yes? Hi, Stephanie from Reuters here. Um, you said that it was a level playing field in Britain, but how is it in China? Um, there have been criticisms that there are unequal barriers to foreign countries doing trade there. What has been done to readdress that if you're encouraging business to go there? Uh, there are plenty of areas of activity in China where, uh, there are, um, where, where the market is not completely open. Um, things change in different sectors. Um, the, uh, it, it is not a completely level playing field. There are many examples of areas of activity where foreign companies either cannot compete or can only compete on the basis that they associate with a local partner. Um, that's a fact of uh, uh, life that's very common in many countries. Um, I don't think that takes away from the point that there are many great business opportunities in China. Uh, what it does mean, of course, is that uh, companies have to do their homework carefully on how they develop their business in China. And it does mean that it's a responsibility of, uh, of, of governments like my own uh, to be arguing uh, the case on specific market access issues. And I would generally ar make the argument, whether it's China or anywhere else, that it's in the interest of the market itself to be more open. I start from a very basic proposition that open markets are generally speaking better for both parties than closed markets. It's why the British take the attitude that we've always done that it doesn't matter kind of what the other end of the trade relationship is doing, it's in our interest to be open. And we think that argument applies at the other end as well. Okay, well, I'm aware Lord Green has a very tight schedule. Can I just thank you very much for your very straightforward and clear answers to all our questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lord Green and Mr. Weir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me once again in thanking the two gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the luncheon. Thank you once again for joining us today. Have a very pleasant afternoon.